Hey, this is Kai Logue, and you're listening to the Real Estate Wholesaling Syndicate. I designed this podcast to get you real, actionable information that you can apply directly into your wholesaling business. There's no fluff, no bullshit, just real advice and real strategies from the best investors and wholesalers in the game. Uh, today, I'm super excited to have our guest with us today. He's going to be talking to us about the difference between on-market wholesaling versus off-market. Joey, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, brother. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, of course, man. I know we uh, did one uh, on, on your show. We'll be happy to run it back. But uh, yeah, so for people who don't know who you are, if you want to uh, give us an intro, if you could go. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Joey Bibbo. I'm out of uh, Freehold, New Jersey. Grew up in West Orange, New Jersey. Um, I've been wholesaling for a little bit over three years now, going on four years now. Um, before wholesaling, I was in the insurance world. I was doing um, financial advising with Mass Mutual, and I did that for about three years. It was all commission, kind of like wholesaling, and then failed in that. Went into wholesaling, and or basically quit in that. Was failing, obviously. Went into wholesaling, and then went all in in basically the beginning of COVID. It was like right before COVID actually started. Was when I started like learning about wholesaling, started taking action. I think maybe I went all in. Nice. That's awesome, man. So what's, what's the journey been about for you since starting then? You know, I feel like a lot of people like to share with you, but uh, you know, you've been entrepreneurship for any amount of time. You know, it's a roller coaster. It's lots of ups and downs. And, uh, you kind of want to share like, how, it's, how the journey's been? Oh, yeah. So it has been a struggle and a grind. So since I got in the business, I mean, even on the insurance end, it was just like calling, 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 whole lot of meetings with people and not too many conversions at first. Once I got into wholesaling, um, kind of the same thing. It took us eight months to close our first deal. We ended up closing two deals in the same like week or two once we finally did. Um, first deal was 15K, second deal was 20K. First deal was a nightmare, second deal was a blessing. Like it was literally just the easiest deal we ever did was that second deal. First one was one of the harder ones I've ever done. But it was, so after that, I was like, we're rich. Like we, we made 35 grand at one time. Like this is freaking awesome. And then it took us another six months to close our next deal. Cause I just like, we stopped marketing obviously when we were selling those two deals. And once we got back to marketing, our pipe was so like slow by then, like we didn't have more activity going out there. And I think we had switched markets like two or three times in that time period, like went to Arizona, they came back to Jersey and we just, it was just a roller coaster for honestly, like about the first three years, it wasn't, it was the beginning of 2023 when i started seeing the most consistency in the business and that was when we were like genuinely closing about a deal to two deals a month consistently and then that was when i had a little bit of a falling out with my old business partner we were we're still best friends now like it's one of my brothers but we just like saw that it was we were not meant to work in business like we just had too many we, we both wanted to leave the ship and it just, we, we couldn't both leave the ship because we're leading in two different directions and you can't have an effective corporation when you're leading it that way. So I ended up walking away. He's still with the other two people we were with for the last three years. And then I just went all in on market when I stopped working with them. And basically that like had a little bit of a lag time in the business. And now it's like really picking back up to the, probably the best rate I've ever been in since I've been in the industry. That's awesome, man. I nah, appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, definitely a lot of similarities. Uh, when I started, first of all, Nightmare. Second one was the easiest to be ever done. Still to this day. And uh, Dana? <laughs> now, now with this business, uh, my, my, my first business, yeah. I think they had a buddy. And, uh, you know, it just didn't work out with the, with the partnerships. Uh, but definitely live and learn. And that's yeah, the cool thing. You take all the experience with you. No, absolutely. Uh, awesome, man. So... The first two deals you did, uh, were those off-market deals? Yeah, so for the first two years, everything was off-market, direct to seller, and all we did was cold call. Yeah. Uh, what, what made you decide to make the switch to uh, on-market? Brokeness? Yeah. Like straight up, like going dead broke, falling. So what happened was, was in um 2022, we were, I like was trying to get BAs for the longest time. I was like, we just got to pull our money together, get the BAs finally, because we knew that like we were doing everything. We were going, we were cold calling, following up, TCing, dispoing, like the whole nine. And like at one point it was, everyone would still cold call. And that was like their main task. And I was still doing every other hat in the business. So once I started trip, we, I went to Ecuador on vacation, found a couple of guys that spoke really good English there. And I'm like, 
these guys could be our VAs. So I hired them, started training them for about a month. I was training them. And when I stopped doing the full acquisition side of the business, we all fell flat on our faces and we had to make a big change because we didn't have money anymore. And we were like, we can't buy more data, keep cold calling. So, but we know we can do this business. We've already closed. I think by then it was like at least 10 deals by now. Like we know what we're doing, but this clearly just isn't working. Us on a trying to cold call, VAs didn't work right now. We don't even have money to pay for them anymore. So then we started JVing with people. And then I had no idea how to JV. Like I literally had like 18 deals in my possession at one time, thinking that we were going to close all of them, not even with one JV agreement in place. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was just like daisy chain deals, like people just sending you stuff. And I'm like, oh, like there's a lot of money to be made here. Like these all look like good deals. Not to realize that like you need to have control of the paper the same way that you're traditionally wholesaling mm -hmm. to be able to get these done. So then that end of la or like end of the summer last year, we went like that was like probably lowest of lows of brokenness for like all of us. Like it was just a fucking struggle. And um then we had to figure out how to JV the right way. We closed an on-market deal during that time period. And then we did about like 50 or 60 grand just in assignments in JVs over the next like three, four months. And then I look back and I'm like, we're making money, but like, we're not getting to where we need to be. Like we're all still check to check right now. And so we decided to like, for me, I was like, we got to go on market because with these JVs, like, yes, sir, you go on Facebook, you reach out to wholesalers, there's going to be wholesalers that need help selling your deals. But now I'm solely depending on them to bring us their deals. And I have no control over when their next deal is coming. And if I just keep reaching out to new people on Facebook, it's like, we just weren't, we weren't getting the traction I wanted. So then I was like, we got to go fully on market because that's another free channel that I've already made money in. So then we started going fully on market. And then that was um, beginning of this year, all in on market. My guys at the time were still JVing with people. I was doing all on market. We did like a 35 pay assignment in one deal in Newark, New Jersey. And that was the deal that was like, like at that point, I'm like, I'm going into PPC. Like I like, now we got a little bit of money. I want to do PPC because I know it's way easier. And then I started getting mentored by Aaron Bevins and Aaron was like, dude, like look at your numbers on market and you're spending $0 on this. Like you got to keep it going on market. And that's when I went all in on market, got with it. We started the 90 day challenge, I think by like August. And then the rest was just history from there. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. It's great to have like mentors. We like, talk, we just have that outside perspective. You know, so I feel like sometimes it can be good when you're in the business. Yeah. So. And it's like, that's the type of stuff. Like, I don't think I would have seen by myself. Right. For me, I'm like, yeah, I know I did on market. I know I made deals here, but it's like, PVC is way easier. Like you literally, like they're coming to us. So why would I not do those? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's like, dude, it's where your money's at. Like if you have enough money to pay a high budget for PPC, then like absolutely go into that avenue. But if you're still bootstrapping where I was when I first got into like the on market stuff, then run your bag up that way and then have the plan to eventually go into the PPC stuff. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm um, back. I feel like we should probably should do this first, but uh, for people who don't know, they're brand new. Uh, you know, what, what's the, what is on market wholesaling? What is off market wholesaling? And what does it make different? Yeah. So on market wholesaling is literally just reaching out to agents that have active listings on the MLS. If you guys don't know what the MLS is, it's a multiple listing service. Basically, what it is is just a platform for agents to put their um, properties on that other agents go on and they bring their buyers to the agent basically it's a way it's a platform to connect buyers and sellers essentially in a nutshell so the strategy that we do i mean in wholesaling a lot of people when they hear about the industry they think like you have to go direct to seller off market meaning like there's not a listed property it means like we get to the seller before the agent gets to the seller and then we negotiate and then when you do it off market there's no commissions involved or anything involved we pay the closing costs and take it as is that that's how we talk to the sellers when it's direct to seller, but when it's on market, it's a listed property and we're going at like, we're going directly to the agent. So we're no longer dealing with the seller. We're only dealing directly with the agent when you're doing an on market deal. Nice. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. So what are the, what are like the big differences like, as far as what, what challenges do you have on, on market or I mean, what are the pros and cons, I guess. So on market is easier in terms of you don't have to spend money and the deals are already there so like once you do find a way to get the good deals the conversion ratio is definitely a lot higher like you're gonna you don't have to make as many offers to get a contract as you would with like let's say a cold calling campaign mm. 
So on that end, it's like, that's where it's definitely easier. However, with the inspection period or option period, as everyone says in Texas, you get a way shorter time because you're dealing with an agent. So it's a lot harder to get like 30 days for an inspection period or option period when you're dealing with the agent because the agent's way savvier than your average homeowner. So they understand like, wait, why do you need 30 days to go look at the property? And even if you're telling them straight up, you're wholesaling it, like they're just usually like, they're not used to giving that long of option periods unless it's like a big commercial deal or a land deal that like there's things involved that need to get it. So they're usually not going to give it to you. So because of that, selling deals on market is definitely a bigger challenge just by that mere fact, because you don't have enough time to get those deals in front of the investors that are going to buy it. Because if you only have 14 days to sell it, then it's a lot harder to sell a deal for, I mean, just. By basic math, if I can have 30 days to sell a deal and I, it takes 30 days to get in front of all the people I need to get in front of versus the 14, then depending where your market is, it's going to be a lot harder to sell that deal. Mm. So one of the biggest things I've learned, and I was, I was talking about this on the live like 20 minutes ago, but one of the biggest things that I learned with on market is the best way to do it and the most effective way is you got to stick in the metros. Like you can't, like a lot of the deals that I locked up that I had to cancel on market during the challenge they were in like really far out towns that because like we would just build like a just take like a whole list from the MLS and it would just have every town in that MLS kind of thing. So a lot of the deals that you're it's kind of goes the same thing off market too. But the I guess the difference is is if you're off market and you can have that longer inspection period. If you're in like a 50k or lower population, it's you could still move that deal. It's not like you can't sell deals in the middle of nowhere, it's just a lot harder and a lot more time consuming. So that if you have 30 days to get it sold, your probability of selling that deal is a lot higher than if you have 14. So what I've noticed on the on market channel is it, it makes way better sense to go just like target the metros, target the secondary markets. Like don't go after like these smaller markets that we're not going to be able to move the deals in. Then you're just going to be wasting your time, the realtor's time, the seller's time a lot more. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So what were some like the um, the biggest mistakes you made uh, when you first started uh, doing on market? Um, probably one of the biggest mistakes. So for the challenge specifically, the biggest mistake I saw was literally no CRM. Like I just did everything off of Google Sheets, and I knew that lesson already. I just was like, we came up with the idea and the snap of a dime, and just were like, let's just do this, and just went right in. But I think the biggest mistake was that was literally going into those bad markets or like going into like the middle of nowhere, getting deals there that were super discounted mm -hmm. and then only having those 14 days. I think right. that was probably one of my biggest mistakes. And then also bottlenecks for on market. Like if, if you only have those 14 days to dispo a deal, you better, if you're using investor lift as your dispo platform, or if you just have a buyer's list, whichever method you're choosing, like you only have 14 days, the second you lock that contract up, it immediately needs to get out there. You can't wait two, three, five seven days to put it out to your investors like the second it gets locked up if you're not on the ball you could you're already like when it, you're already losing an uphill battle because you only have 14 days typically right that makes sense now do you ever have any pushback uh from any like the buyers because oh, this is not like wow this is on the market or so this is listed there, there will be the pushback from buyers like that but honestly, at the end of the day, like if there's money for the buyers to make, if that's what it is, it's an ego thing with that buyer. You know what I mean? Like if they're like, oh, I saw it at 160 and you're selling it to me for 120, I could have negotiated it at 120. And it's like, look, I understand that, but I have the contract right now and I do have other guys interested. So like if that 120 and like, but I'm selling my deals on the dispo and I'm showing them what they can make. And I'm like, this is where you can make. If that makes sense for you, great. If not, then we keep it moving. Oh, uh, yeah. But that is a big objection you will get is like, oh, well, I could have got it for that. It's like, cool, but we're, we're here right now. I but Exactly, but you did it. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, it's a great way to handle it. Uh, that's awesome. So what what do you do? It's like if someone's brand new, they want to get started, say, hey, I'm, I'm going to go on market. Um, what what do you do? Like, if you, Is there like certain criteria you're pulling from the MLS? Or is there a certain way you're, you're stacking the list so that you're looking at deals or how you're evaluating them? I guess it's a lot of questions at one, but um, yeah. I don't need, yeah, yeah, I don't get started, I guess. Yeah. So basically, bare bones, if you guys want to get started um, doing the on market channel, if you don't have too much money to spend in marketing or you just bootstrap budget, whatever it is, the first thing you do is you go into redfin.com. I used to go into Zillow, but redfin.com, you can filter out for time mm -hmm. and then go after properties that have been listed for 45 days plus on Redfin. 
So that means that they haven't sold for whatever reason. And once you do, once you find a property that hasn't sold for whatever reason, usually it's because it's overpriced. Now it's our job to go in and negotiate that price down and get it under contract to give it to our investors. So the criteria past that is 45 days. And then you can do what's called a keyword search. In a keyword search, you put in as is, investor special, handyman special, or just investor, cash only. There's like a bunch of different investor filters that you can filter out for, but the simplest ones are as is an investor. So if you want to keep it super simple, those are the two I'd go after. And then I, then you go in and then you literally look for properties that look like they need some work. And then those you add to your list. And then basically I build the list. I put a Zillow link on it. If I'm in a disclosure state, meaning like the MLS is, or the actual sold comps are accurate. If it's a non-disclosure state, like, um, like Texas, for example, then I'll still do the Zillow link just so that I can see the pictures, of the property, but then I'm going into like a Propelio, a Privy, um, uh, or the actual MLS itself, and that's how I'm going to comp it. But the reason that I'm doing the Zillow link for the, uh, what is it, the disclosure states is because I comp on Zillow and when I'm in disclosure states. So I'm literally just double clicking that link in whether it's a CRM or a spreadsheet so that I just have that property right up and ready for me. I know like I have to side by side so I know what that property looks like, that's best, what neighborhood it's in. So when I go into Zillow to comp it, everything's like right there. Nice. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, as always, if you guys have any questions, make sure you drop them in the comments and we'll go ahead. We'll get an answer to the Q&A portion of the transfer over that, but I know they get a lot of value answer that on the screen. So what are you, um, what's your process from there? So you have a list, um, you have these ones, they look like, hey, these, these look like they might be good ones. Um, are you, so are you running the comps real quick there too to, to see like, okay, this one looks like, say you're just anyone, you're just going to get an offer of it. That's it. If it looks like it needs some work, I'm not worried about where it's listed at. I'm literally just worried about what does the property look like? And then what is, like, I'll maybe read the listing description really quick. If they're like motivated seller, that's going to the list, obviously. But even if it just says like, as is cash sale, something like that, I'm just looking to put as, if, if we're in a metro, I'm looking to put as many in that metro as we can on that list. And then just, I don't comp before I call, I call them and I comp while I'm on the call. So I'm literally like analyzing the deal while I'm on the call, even if it's listed at 250 and I got to be at 100, like if it's listed at 250 and I got to be at 100, there's a reason why it hasn't sold. And usually it's extremely overpriced. The first thing I'm asking the realtor is like, is it the seller? Is it you kind of thing? Like, it's not the first question I'm asking them, obviously yeah. when we're getting into the negotiation side of the sale, like I'm literally like, like what, like I try to get that out of them. Like, is it you that's seeing that or is it the seller that's unrealistic? And if I'm not seeing it, where they get their numbers from, and then I'll try to educate them on like, yeah, two fifty might be our ARV, but like your house is going to need sixty, seventy grand of work to get that two fifty. That's why I got to be at the hundred k kind of thing. Mm. It's awesome. So how what what else happens during those conversations with the realtors? I know like group realtors are notoriously hard to get a hold of. Uh, like how many how many times do you, you hit them up like before you move on to the next one, or you keep hitting them up? I double dial them and I'll shoot them a text and sometimes leave them a voicemail. Mm -hmm. To be the most effective, some of my um, new acquisition managers that are working for me now, they'll do all four, I guess. They'll do a call, text, voicemail, and email. And they've been having, the, like, one of my guys just locked up a deal from email. So I know it works on every angle, but that's, like, the way to get a hold of them. For me, if they don't want to get on the phone, though, I'm, like, texting them to get them on the phone. I'm not texting them to talk about the property. Right. Like if they're like texting me like, oh, well, what questions do you have? Let me just text about it. I'm in a meeting. I'm in this. I'm in that. I'm like, let's get on a call. Like, what's a good time to get on a call? It's way easier if we get on a call. Like, what, what's a better what's a better time to speak? Mm -hmm. And then if they're one of those people that just won't get on the phone for me, I don't do business with them. So I kind of just keep it moving because like, I'd rather it's it's like you're already, be di you're already being difficult to get on the phone. So like you're probably going to be more difficult in other parts of the transaction anyways. So for me, I'd rather just find the next person that, that is going to be, that means my help kind of thing. Like if the realtor, that's really what I'm looking for on the on market channel is like a realtor that needs my help moving their deal. That is your avatar realtor you want to find to get deals done off market. Like you want to find that person that's like, not the one that's like, oh no, I could sell my deal. Cause if they could sell their deal, they're not going to go with our low offer anyways, or let alone with the wholesaling offer. Mm -hmm. But yeah. You know, that makes sense. So what do you, like, is there a way to like check to see if like they actually like give the offer to the client? Like another, we're supposed to, but do you feel like sometimes they don't give your offer to the client? 
So I don't, they, I feel like there's no real way to check that. But what I do is I'm almost positive. If, I'm not a realtor, so I don't know the exact rules, obviously. But from my understanding of everything, if you put it in writing, they have to present it legally. Mm-hmm. So I always tell them, I'm like, I'm going to just send you a proof of, sorry. I'm going to just send you a letter of intent that's going to basically just go over the terms of our offer. I just want to show the seller that we're actually serious. That's just what I say. And then they'll be like, okay, it's send over what your email, whatever. But um, the biggest thing too with the on-market stuff, so you know the agent, not only are they presenting our offer to the seller, you need to make sure the ed- the agent is conveying it in a positive manner. Like you don't want to be that guy that you shoot an 80K offer and now the property is listed at 150 and the agent's like, oh yeah, another one came in at 80K. You know what I mean? Like you want to be like the one that it's like, they, you want the, the, if the agent doesn't have the belief in your offer, they're not going to convey it correctly to the seller and the seller will never accept that offer. They're not going to feel good about it. So you, my goal when I'm on these calls too, is to get the agent to be on my side and understand like, yes, this might be a low offer, but like, this is why it is so low. Not like I could be at 80 K and that's it. It's like, this is why we're getting here. This is what I'm seeing. And I try to make sure they agree with me so they, they can see what I'm seeing. And now when they go back to the seller, it's like a way better conversation than like, oh yeah, another 80 K came in. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Like that's really all the difference. Um, what do you, what do you do to, is there anything you do to try to get the agent on the same team as you and to present the offer in the right way? I, I think it's more just going over the numbers and letting them understand, like I am the expert at this. Mm-hmm. Like you may be the retail person and I'm not, and I don't try to walk like on top of the agents and try to sound like I'm better than them. But I just want to distinguish myself as the expert in terms of like, I do know what I'm talking about. What I'm saying, there is like validity behind it. I'm not just like throwing numbers on a wall and hoping it sticks. And then like, I think the way that I combat that is obviously when I'm talking about the comps with them, like an agent knows that someone knows what they're doing. Uh, I feel like at the end of the day, like if I'm talking about comps, you are going over properties, going over the actual construction of a house or how it's like a house looks like, I think the best question I always ask is they'll be like, they're like, how's the electrical HVAC and plumbing? And they'll be like, oh, everything's good. It's in working order. Be like, it's a 1950 bill. Is it brand new? Like, is it original to when the house was built or have those things been updated? And then once I start speaking, like, from my experience, I think that just solidifies me. Like, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. And now they're going to trust me and, and convey it to this color. Obviously, once I get them to understand, I'm not low ball until. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, especially telling them this is how I came up with the offer as opposed to the other like, here. Yeah. Exactly. And honestly, on the because I'm still doing a lot of off market too. I'm tr- I'm like literally telling the seller it too. I think I feel like you you are doing that too as well. Like I'm kind of yeah. telling them like it's not just sixty k or eighty k. Like this is what I could sell it for. This is how much it's going to cost me to fix it. That that's why I'm coming with this number. And then when they tell me no, or if they tell me no, now I can go back and be like, these are your options. Like now. If it costs me a hundred grand, it's going to cost you a hundred to 120 grand because you don't have your contractors. If you have the bandwidth to do that, then do it. But if not, then that conveys to them like, okay, maybe I should take this offer kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I feel like it's much easier. They actually showing where the value is eating against, you know, hey, maybe you might make an extra 10 K it's going to take you three more months as opposed to maybe they're thinking they're make an extra hundred K. And I feel like that's the biggest thing is like, they, th- they're like, no, I could sell it at 200. Like right now, and it's like once you educate whether it's the agent or the seller, once you educate them, and you're like, why you show them why they can't sell it at 200 right now? You show them a couple of properties that sold at 200, and it's like they know their property's not that one. Now, logically, they're getting behind the numbers. Then obviously, we got to get them to make the emotional based decision to accept a lower number. But at least logically, it's starting to make more sense for them. Where logically, like 80k, I want 200. If you just tell me 80K, there's nothing logically that would ever make me sit there and accept your 80K. Right. That makes sense. Now, for, um, you know, as far as like competition level, I know it's like the market is very, very saturated. There's a lot of competition as far as off market. Do you find it's like the same for on market or is it less competitive than off market? It is just the same, bro. It's actually crazy because like, I didn't realize there were this many people doing on market real estate until I did it like at this scale of like doing the challenge and everything, bro, there are so many wholesalers doing what I'm doing right now. It's not even funny. Like there's, there's a big group of people doing it. I feel like it's almost like spot on with the direct to seller channel. Okay. Cause like, there's so many deals I see 
fall out, fall out, fall out. Like every, they'll be out for 180 days or something. And they had like four or five contracts on them. And almost every time they were other wholesalers that had the deals before me. Hmm. That's crazy. Yeah. And I was being taught pretty heavily. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. What, what do you think? If someone's brand new, uh, where do they want to start? Do you think they can start on market? Uh, so for me, I think it's all about where their financial status is at that current moment. Like if they're starting brand new and they need to like literally, like they don't have money to spend on marketing at all, then I say on market is literally the best channel, either on market or JVing with people. But if you've never done a deal yet, you probably should do on market because you don't know how to sell deals yet. So I'd say on market, if you don't have any money, if you do have money and you can pay for some VAs, then I would say like get some VAs, get some data, or go straight into PPC, but PPC is way more expensive. So probably get some VAs, get some data, and then have the VAs do the cold calls for you. I used to be the biggest proponent for um, cold calling yourself. Like that's how I started, and I was like the biggest advocate for it. But what I what I once you understand the KPIs behind it, for me it doesn't make sense for somebody to go out there and do two hundred calls every single day to get their first deal when it could take like literally a month to a month and a half just to get your first contract. And if that contract doesn't close, you're already done kind of thing. Whereas like with the on market, they're already selling. So you don't have to qualify the leads. So it's like, you're literally going after people that already raised their hand that they want to sell. We know they want to sell. Now it's just a matter of, can we get these negotiated at the price we can make money on? And that's the only battle that you have to face versus when you're direct to seller and you're not doing, and you're doing the cold calling yourself and you're wearing every single hat. It's a lot like, and it's kind of funny I say this because I know I like Charles Stanbeck is one guy that I know that he does this himself. Like he does the cold calling himself. He does the whole process himself. And he's very like, he's earning, I think like 30 to 50 G's a month right now by himself and wholesaling just doing that strategy. So it's like, I know it works. But for me, it's just like from what I experienced and what I went through, it's just, it's a painful process. So I'd rather people do the on-market stuff just to get like their feet wet and just get like in the door, get some money in your pocket and then build a strategy to get into the off-market channel once you get your teeth punched in a couple of times by these realtors and like you learn what a deal is, you understand how to do this stuff. Now you go into the off-market channel with some money and you're going to be successful with that money as long as you're taking the right steps to be successful on the off-market. Yeah, I like that. It's a lot of men. Well, it looks like we got a question. So if we ask anybody else has any, make sure to drop them in just a moment. We're going to go over the Q and A portion. Have to make sure we get them answered for you guys. So make sure you just hang out, stay tuned. Uh, so do you guys have like any or do you, or do you have any like KPIs or anything that like numbers that you track in your business that get offered? So when we first started the challenge, before we started like really making a lot of offers, it was about. It was about like 20 offers to a contract when I first started the challenge. But then once we like real, like I started just blasting out offers and honestly, I think the numbers might still be that good, but because I didn't have the follow-up system, like tuned in for the challenge, I think that bottlenecked me a lot of on my acquisitions. So I'd say it's probably like right now, it's probably about 30, between 30 to 50 offers to get a contract on market if I want to be super, super conservative. But I mean, I've had people that tried this strategy and did 10 call or 10 offers and got a contract before. Like it, it, it is possible, but for your average person to take between 30 to 50, they get a contract. Okay. Yeah. Those are, just, uh, those are offers, right? So. Exactly. And then I uh, should have asked you before, uh, but what, what is the challenge you want to uh, explain what the challenge is that you're doing? Yeah. So it's a 250 K and 90 day challenge and it's only on market. So since we started the challenge, the only go like I've closed other deals in the business but they didn't account for the challenge because they weren't sourced on market and they were from the day that the challenge started till now. And so, yeah, so this challenge, I mean, it's been a freaking struggle, honestly, but we're, I got a couple like of a 10 unit building in Staten Island that I'm hoping to assign for about like a hundred to 200 K. So that one will get me like ridiculously close to that goal, but the challenge is over next week. So I'm just hoping that one gets assigned by them, but it will not be close and funded by that. Yeah. Right. Nice. Yeah, it's bad. Uh, now, are you seeing all the recordings? Do you think people go back and watch them all from the beginning? Yeah, all of the recordings are on my Facebook, and before they're most of them are on mine. And I was doing them with Aaron Bevins for a while, so they should be on his Facebook as well. Nice. Thank you. I can come up with the idea to do the challenge. So what made you want to do it? Yeah. 
Wait, give me two seconds. Sorry about that. Wait, so say it again? Yeah, so, so what we do, I decided to do the challenge. I just, the idea. Um, so I decided to do the challenge because we wanted to prove the on-market like strategy. So we were already doing it. And like I was in the um, accelerated wealth community with Quentin Flores and Aaron Bevins. And when I started doing the on-market, like we saw the success I was having and I saw a bunch of people that were sitting in, like we had a Discord or like a big group that everyone was doing it in. And a lot of people were just sitting there like, struggling doing direct to seller marketing so i was like let's like pe- people clear like we clearly don't have too much money right now like personally like in our own businesses so i'm like why don't we show people like how i'm doing it because i had like four or five other people i knew that i was working like not in business with but working alongside with or just helping out and they were like sitting there just like struggling bro like on a dialer calling every single day like taking action it's not like they were like not taking action they were taking so much action but they just were never getting conversions and i was like man this fucking sucks like i don't want to see people because like i was there like I, I i was in that exact seat so i was literally like okay like i need to um i need to figure out like i want to show everybody how to do this stuff and that was like kind of when the challenge like when we got the idea of doing the challenge i was like for me i did it for an accountability thing i was like if i say i'm gonna do this thing i'm gonna end up doing it and i'm like we gotta i, I want to go big with the challenge so that i'm like locked in and it was kind of inspired through rj bates with the 50 50 50. Mm-hmm. so originally like i'm starting to teach everybody the on market stuff like i'm helping a lot of people in the community who are struggling doing the like the direct seller off market cold calling so i'm getting them to start doing this stuff and then we have like an event in San Antonio I come down to and I'm talking to Aaron and I'm like, I want to do the 50, 50, 50 on market. And like, I'm already like, I know RJ Bates went to the Titanium Crucible, all this stuff. So I DM and I'm like, dude, I think I'm going to do a 50, 50, 50, but I'm going to do it on market. Dude, thank God I like had like a step back and was like, no, don't do it. Like, don't do a 50, 50, 50, because that would have been a nightmare on market. Like, it's yeah. like, it's way different than doing direct to seller because it's like you can't lock up a contract on that call. Usually the realtor has to go convey it to the seller. Mm-hmm. But then I was like, instead of doing 50, 50, 50, let's just do a financial goal. And at first I was like 75 hard. Why don't we just mimic it after that? But then I'm like, you know what? Like, any sales cycle goes in 90 days. Mm-hmm. So why don't we just do a full 90 days, 250K, and then prove it on market? And then that was when, that was like basically how it started. And then it was like literally from the day the idea started to when we actually saw the challenge, it was probably about a week. <laughs> we just like live streamed out first day and like that was it. We just had at it. I love it. That's great. You love me for having this yeah. So what do you do? So you get an offer out. Um, do you guys, like, do you, do you still follow up? Like, do you, like, if you don't hear back from the agent, like, when you see it's like a week or two later, it's still on market and follow back up. But what's your process like for that? Yeah. So once they tell me no on the offer, usually I'll follow up another, like, I'd say about a week and a half to two weeks out. See if it's still sitting. If they, and a lot of times the agents will call you back if, like, you're the only actual offer that came in. But um, if they, Say they're going to present the offer. I always ask when's the next time they're going to be able to speak. Like, when's the best time to follow up? Will you be able to speak with the seller tonight, mm-hmm. tomorrow, like whenever? And then I'll get the cadence for that, follow up that way. But if it's like a no kind of thing, or it's just like, no, that doesn't make sense, I'd give it about like a week and a half, two weeks, or even just like the end of each week, keep following up with them. And you should be able to, like, eventually over time, if it still keeps sitting, it's the same thing with direct to selling. Like, if they need to sell and they, it's listed, so they do need to sell usually they're going to end up eventually going with your offer. Awesome. Yeah. That that's, makes a lot of sense. So, very advanced. So yeah. Any other, um, any final thoughts or anything? Um, yeah, I didn't ask or anything you want to share with the audience. Of my biggest thing is, I mean, obviously anyone that's getting into real estate, whichever marketing channel you guys choose, because one of the biggest debates that a lot of people have in this industry is what's the best marketing channel to choose. The one thing I'll say for all you guys, it's whatever makes the best sense for your situation. If you guys are working a W-2 job and you have money to feed into your business and you don't have too much time to spend on your business, don't do on-market real estate because it's going to take a lot of time to be able to get this channel going. I would recommend going to one of the paid marketing channels and it's not about which is going to be the best, it's which is going to be the best that you can afford. Meaning like PBC is going to be probably your highest cost, whereas Cold calling is going to be your lowest cost. And then there's many like texting, direct mail, many other channels in between. 
it's not about what's going to be the best channel. It's just what's going to, what is the best for your situation and go off of that. I, that would be my best advice for everybody. And it's like, we're all going to be different financial situations when we get into the, this industry, but it, make sure that you get around people that know what they're doing and then just have them point you in the right directions and then know your financial situation. If you don't got money on market, if you have some money, either get, get a list cold call that list or have VA, I'd recommend VAs call that list or go into the higher paid ads and have had way easier conversion ratios with those higher paid ads. 100%. That's great advice. Awesome too. Q&A, it looks like we just got one question today. Um, so it looks like it's JV. Uh, he asked, can you touch faith on the difference between on market and off market merchant right? So it's actually exactly the same. So the, so the biggest um, I guess question a lot of people have with the, with the, what's the biggest difference between the two of them? The only difference is, is there's just an agent involved. It's still wholesaling at the end of the day. Like it's still whatever price an investor would pay, they will pay that price on any given deal. Obviously the one thing to look out for on market is like, unless it just got listed, like let's say it's been sitting for the 45 days. If your MAO is coming in very close to the listing price, try to cause a little bit of separation there. Come a little bit lower than that price because that is the one thing that will differentiate on your deals. Like if they see that they got a 10K higher than you had it for, then now it's like, okay, the data is already out there in their face. Like they're now that ego is going to get in the way, no matter, even if it was a good deal, it will be a little bit harder to sell. So I'd recommend anchor a little bit higher if your MAO comes that much, like, it's listed for 200 you could offer 180 offer like 160 so that you could sell it for the 180 instead of trying to sell it for 200 if it's been up 45 days that makes sense awesome man well hey yeah i really appreciate you coming on i got a bunch of value i'm sure everyone else did as well uh what's the best way for people to connect with you probably what you're up to Connect with me either on Instagram um, or Facebook. If you guys need me, just reach out to me on Instagram. I'll give you guys my number, and I'm, I'm here to help anybody that needs help in this industry. So just hit me up. I'm here for you guys, and I got three years of experience to bring value to y'all, so we got you. Awesome, man. What's your, uh, what's your handle on this here? Joey Bibbo on Instagram. Perfect. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again uh, for coming on, and uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in. A quick announcement for everyone. Our next beat up, the Real Estate Wholesaling Syndicate meetup is going down San Antonio, November 8th from 6 to 9 p.m. You're not going to want to miss this one. we got a badass lineup of speakers, including Uncle Charles, Logan Fulmer, and Travis Wells, and myself. Don't miss this one. Uh, make sure you go and grab your tickets now. Just go to wholesalingsyndicate.com to grab your tickets. Again, that's wholesalingsyndicate.com. And I put together a surprise for all the listeners for the podcast. So just make sure to type in promo code syndicate. Again, that's promo code syndicate to get your free gift.